Tonight we want to continue our study from the book of 1 Corinthians, and we want to pick up uh, in chapter 1, where verses 10 through 17. And so let's begin by reading the passage in its entirety. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 17. The Bible says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. In Nate's study of verses 1 through 9, as well as his introduction study, he pointed out that Paul, throughout this letter, and especially into his second letter to the Corinthians, clearly feels the need to point out his position and his authority as an apostle of Christ. The references are sometimes subtle, but for example, in verse 10 of our text, Paul pleads with them by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul had to say was not his own opinion, not his own think so. It was by the authority of Christ, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. We too will need to keep that in mind as we study, because Paul takes a stand on some issues that are, to be frank, not popular in our modern society. Many people today will ignore Paul's teachings, saying that they're out of touch or out of style or that they're intended for a different time and a different culture. Or some will go so far as to accuse Paul of being a chauvinist, especially when it comes to matters involving women. But again, we need to remember that Paul spoke by the authority of Christ. What he said is as binding today as it was when the apostle penned these words centuries ago. In verse 10 here, Paul breaks the ice to what will be one of the main themes of this letter, and that is the sin of division. There was obviously a problem with division in the church at Corinth. According to verse 11, Paul had heard about it from those of the household of Chloe. Now, we don't know anything more about this person, Chloe, but she was likely a member of the church there at Corinth, or in the least, she or someone from her family had witnessed the problems there at Corinth. And it seems apparent that the Corinthians would have been acquainted with her and that Paul sees those of her household as reliable witnesses. It's kind of interesting to me, though, that Paul publicly outs her like this, which makes it clear that this is more than just gossip or, or hearsay. You know, usually when somebody spreads gossip, they don't want their name connected with the story. But Paul just comes out and says exactly who he heard it from. Vine suggests that the mention of them and her name implies their willingness to be known as the informants. It was not a case of mere tale-telling, but of God-fearing disclosure to the one who was especially qualified to handle the matter. In other words, those of Chloe's house didn't bring this word to Paul for their own pleasure. They did it out of love and out of concern for their brethren at Corinth. This subject of division that Paul brings up here is a very serious one. It's a problem that has plagued the religious world for many years. It's sad to say, but the picture that the world sees of Christianity is one with much religious division between various denominations, between liberal and conservative factions of any given denomination, between members of the same congregation even. Many people don't take the problem of religious division seriously. In fact, they seem content to just continue with denominational names and doctrines that divide so many, as if Differences are not important. In fact, the world today often praises such division as a good thing. They call it diversity. Well, Paul makes it clear that in the Lord's church, division is not to be taken lightly. As I said, it's apparent that this was a big problem at Corinth. I don't know that it had been carried to the extent that they were no longer fellowshipping one another nor had actually split, as many churches do today, but Paul's use of the word contentions there in verse 11 signifies the notion of, of quarreling, strife, bitter discussions, according to Strong's Dictionary. And Paul uses the same word frequently in his listing of sins. For example, in Romans 1 and Galatians 5, 
right along with all kinds of wickedness, idolatry, immorality, even murder, he lists, lists the sin of strife and contention. And so what was the reason for these divisions? Why were these brethren so divided? As we said, this is a main theme of Paul's letter, really from here in chapter 1 all the way through chapter 4. And we'll see as we study these passages that the surface reasons for their disputes focused on several different topics, such as teachers, how to deal with immorality, going to law against one another, marriage and divorce, eating sacrificial meats, the conduct of women, the Lord's Supper, spiritual gifts, and the resurrection. And Paul will address each of these topics, but I propose that these were just indicators, really, of a deeper, more serious problem. I think the real root of their problem is addressed here in chapter 1 in verse 10, when Paul addresses or urges them to speak the same thing, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Whenever there is division and contention in the church, more often than not, it's because one or more parties are not following Paul's advice here. And so let's examine these exhortations and, and make sure that we understand them. First, Paul instructs them to speak the same thing. The commentator Lightfoot says that this phrase was used in politics and that it meant to be at peace or to make up differences. And so how is it that we can speak the same thing? Well, to put it plainly, if we speak that which Christ taught, that which the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write, and that which God has given us in his word. Paul often reminded his readers and his listeners that his message was not his own. For example, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. In chapter 14, in verse 37, he wrote, The things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. And again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, he said, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Our goal, not only for teachers or preachers, but for all Christians, should be to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. Peter urged in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. The funny thing is, many of these brethren in Corinth knew what to speak because they had been given the spiritual gifts of utterance and knowledge, according to verse 5. But yet they still chose to teach or preach or base their beliefs on their own opinions. You know, that sounds a whole lot like the religious world today, doesn't it? Of course, we don't have spiritual gifts, but, but we have the complete and perfect Word of God. And if we all follow the one true pattern, then our chances of division will be remarkably less. Well, next, Paul urges these brethren, and, and us as well, to be perfectly joined together in the same mind. The word translated mind here is from a Greek word which means thought, counsels, purpose, intellect, thinking. And so we need to think alike. How is that, though? Well, in the next chapter, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, he quotes the prophet Isaiah who asked, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And then Paul adds, but we have the mind of Christ. In Romans 15 and verse 5, Paul says to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. And in Philippians 2 verses 1 through 5, he speaks of being like-minded and of one mind, talking specifically about thoughts of love and mercy and humility. And then he makes it very clear when he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so in short, we need to strive to think like Christ. And the more we do, the more likely we will be of one mind. Lastly then, Paul tells his brethren that they should be joined together in the same judgment. The word translated judgment here is from a Greek word that carries with it the idea of view or opinion or judgment. To be honest, it's very hard for me at least to tell the difference between the meaning of in the same mind and in the same judgment. In fact, some translations have purpose or thought here instead of judgment, but those were some of the same words that we used to define mind in the previous statement. Brother Mark Bailey in his commentary on 1 Corinthians says that Paul here is referring to the determination to accept the word of God as the final authority, not to be divided over the procedure of dealing with problems, to agree to allow God's word to be the only rule of judging. 
Well, getting back to the church at Corinth and their particular problems, as I said, I believe the, the root of their division, in fact, the root of all division, was and is an unwillingness to put Christ and his word first. But in verses 12 and 13, Paul delves into a particular problem that these Corinthians may have had as a result. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 12 and 13, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now there's a lot of debate among scholars and commentators about what exactly Paul was referencing here in these verses. At face value, it seems that the Corinthian church had split into four factions, and each one claimed a different leader or head. Of course, we know who Paul and Christ are. Cephas here is believed by most to be referring to the apostle Peter, and Apollos was the well-spoken Jew that we can read of in Acts 18, who Aquila and Priscilla took aside and explained the way of God more accurately. Exactly what roles these names played in the division at Corinth, though, is unclear. But let me share a few proposed theories with you. First of all, as I said, we can take this at face value, and we can conclude that certain factions at Corinth were loyal, literally loyal, to one of these names. It's reasonable to believe that, that some of them would follow Paul. Uh, he is the one who had established the congregation there in Corinth in the first place, according to Acts 18. Peter might have gained followers because he was an original apostle, after all, who walked with Jesus, or because he especially appealed to the Jews, or because he was the first to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, although I don't know that, that he ever actually uh, physically visited Corinth. Apollos, though, did uh, work in Corinth, and he was known to be an eloquent speaker, according to Acts 18 and verse 24. And so per perhaps some of them were drawn by his speech. But then there's the last group that Paul names here that, that makes this interpretation, at least to me, difficult. He says that there are those who say, I am of Christ. Now, if this is to be taken literally, then I suppose this last group could be the only group who actually had it right, because certainly Jesus Christ should be our only head, our only allegiance. Or perhaps these brethren were being divisive by claiming Christ as their head in opposition to the apostles against Peter and Paul or Apollos, not willing to accept their authority or, or heed their teachings. Or maybe there was some intended inflection in Paul's voice here. Maybe he meant that, that while the factions at Corinth were claiming various men as their head, some were saying Paul, some were saying Peter, some Apollos, that instead they should be claiming only Christ. In other words, perhaps what he's saying here is, you say I'm of Paul or I'm of Peter or I'm of Apollos, but I am of Christ. Well, it's important to note that, that if these were literal factions based around these three or four men, the men themselves certainly did not promote nor condone such. Paul certainly did nothing to ask for such a following. In fact, he discouraged it. I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther when he heard that the first Protestants were being called Lutherans. He said, Who is Luther? The teaching is not mine nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, miserable bag of dust and ashes that I am, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my name? Now, another interpretation is that there really were three or more factions among the brethren at Corinth, but instead of these men named, that the real ringleaders were actually members of the church there in Corinth. In that case, Paul chooses not to call them out publicly, but instead he uses these pseudonyms, if you will, or fake names in his writings to protect their identities. In fact, one piece of evidence for this theory is what Paul later writes in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. He says there, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Perhaps these things that Paul speaks of here is, is referring to the divisions that were named in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. And so again, Paul says that, that I've used our names for your sakes um, basically to, to, uh, to hide you, if you will, or to uh, keep your names secret. 
Well, there's one other interpretation that, that some give, uh, and that is that Paul is using these four names here, including his own, merely as an allegory or a metaphor for just division in general. Not that there were literally three or four factions, but that there was just division in general, and again, Paul is merely using this as, as an illustration, if you will. Scholars that hold this opinion point out that the, the language is meant to show how childish these Corinthians were being, that they sounded a lot like children who would say, I'm on his team or I'm on her team. Well, you know, I tend to think that, that there was at least some sort of party forming going on because Paul does dwell on this for, for quite a while. He even brings this idea of, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos up later in chapter 3. And these factions could have been based on different social divisions among the members. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26, we see that the majority of church members were not particularly high on the social scale. Some were even slaves, according to chapter 7. And then in Paul's instructions concerning the Lord's Supper in chapter 11, he scolds them for shaming, shaming those who have nothing. But Paul also suggests that some of the members were powerful and wealthy or of nobility. For example, in Romans 16 and 23, it implies that Erastus, who was actually the city treasurer, was a member of the church at Corinth. Well, regardless of whether these party names were literal or not, or not Paul's conclusion in verse 13 is still very clear. And that is that the church is not to be divided into any kind of factions. It is to be united under Christ, the one and only one who was crucified for us and into whose name we are baptized. Even the church of Christ today needs this same warning. We can't rally behind certain preachers or leaders at the expense of dividing the church. We don't follow men. We follow Christ. Well, in verses 14 through 17, Paul continues his thought from the end of verse 13 with the notion that we are not baptized in the name of any man. We are baptized into Christ. He says there, beginning with verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. There's no telling how many people obeyed the gospel at the preaching of the Apostle Paul. We don't know how large the church here at Corinth was. Estimates range anywhere from 40 to 150 members. But surely many of those first heard the gospel from Paul. As we said, Paul established the church there at Corinth. But Paul makes a point here to state that out of all these converts, only a handful of them were actually physically baptized by him. Apparently it was his practice to appoint someone else, perhaps someone that was traveling with him, such as Silas or Timothy, but someone else to perform the baptisms. You know, I've heard stories of how old-timey preachers would let young, aspiring preachers who were traveling with them do much of the baptizing at their gospel meetings. And I've been told by brethren who have preached in foreign lands, such as Africa, that it's common to let the local brethren perform most, if not all, of the baptisms because really of the very same problem that Paul is addressing here for fear that being baptized by an American could become a status symbol and might be a source of division. Well, if being baptized by Dwayne Permenter, for example, could cause someone to be puffed up, then imagine what being baptized by the one and lonely Apostle Paul might do. And so Paul thanks God that he only baptized Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanus. We can read of the conversion of Crispus, a ruler of the Jewish synagogue uh, in Corinth, in Acts 18 and verse 8. We're not specifically told about the conversion of Gaius, but Paul later mentions him as his host on his second trip to Corinth, Romans 16, 23. And likewise, we don't know the details of the conversion of Stephanus, but he and his household are mentioned at the end of this letter in 1 Corinthians 16, 15 and 17 as being the first converts in Achaia and ones who have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I guess it's worth mentioning here that <clears throat> some people have questioned why Paul seems to forget Stephanus in verse 15 and then mentions him as an afterthought, it seems, in verse 16, and then admits that he can't remember if he baptized anyone else or not. 
And the argument here is that if Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit, that is, if the Holy Spirit was telling him what to write, then how is it that he could have trouble remembering anything? Well, besides this, to me, being nitpicking, I think there is also a, a simple explanation. Indeed, Jesus promised in John 14 and 26 that the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. But notice there that Jesus says that the Spirit will help them remember all things that he had said to them. In other words, all things that were important to the preaching of the gospel. You know, the Bible is written by men, at least 40 of them, each with his own writing style and personality. But what's important is that the Holy Spirit guided them to all truth, according to John 16 and 13. To be honest, I think Paul is being a little tongue-in-cheek here, and he's simply downplaying the importance of who baptized whom. As one commentator named Hayes points out, it doesn't seem like Paul has actually forgotten Stephanus since he mentions him again in chapter 16. But basically, Paul is saying, it doesn't matter who baptized you. You were baptized into Christ. Well, that leads us to the last verse that we want to examine tonight, verse 17. It's one that's been misunderstood and, and dare I say, abused by many in the denominational world by taking it out of context and trying to use it to prop up their false doctrine. When Paul says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, Many will point here and say, aha, even Paul says that baptism is not important, is not necessary. And so you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Well, really, we only have to look at the context to see that that's not the meaning that Paul has here at all. In fact, to see the correct meaning, uh, the context says it all. Paul had just gotten finished saying that he was thankful that he didn't personally perform the baptism of many of his audience. The reason being, who you were baptized by didn't matter. But that didn't mean that baptism itself didn't matter or that it was unnecessary. In fact, this is an example of what's been called the, the not-but construction that Paul uses here. And it's found often in the New Testament. It always serves to give emphasis to one thing without denying the other. Let me show you a couple of examples. Uh, in John 6 and verse 27, Jesus said, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Now, did Jesus mean here that we are forbidden to work in order to provide food for ourselves and our family? No, in fact, we're commanded elsewhere to do just that. Again, in Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, but do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, does that mean that it's wrong to have a savings account or a retirement plan? No, in fact, we're encouraged to be good stewards and to plan ahead. The point of all of these not-but constructions is to give emphasis to the last half without denying the first half. Paul's primary mission was to preach. And Thayer says that that means to instruct men concerning the things that pertain to Christian salvation. But among those things was the necessity of baptism. Jesus commissioned the apostles to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 19. Paul taught baptism in all of his letters. He explains how it is the way we get into Christ and put on Christ. And without exception, in every example of conversion we have in the book of Acts, many of which were results of Paul's preaching, the person was baptized. If we try to pull 1 Corinthians 1 and 17 out of context and say that Paul didn't think baptism was necessary, then really that's not only ridiculous, but quite frankly, it's being dishonest. Well, finally this evening, Paul describes his preaching in verse 17 as being not with wisdom of words. Other translations have this as not with rhetoric or clever speech or eloquence. Some say that Paul is admitting that he is, a not, is, that he is not a very good speaker, even to the point that this might have been, some have suggested, Paul's thorn in the flesh that he asked to be removed in 2 Corinthians 12. It's hard, though, to imagine Paul's speech being anything less than desirable when you consider the great 
speeches or orations that he gave, for example, on Mars Hill or before Philip or, or rather um, Felix or Agrippa. Paul's point, I think, here is that it's all about the message, not the messenger. The gospel of Christ is, as he would write in Romans 1.16, the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes it. Paul didn't want to convert anyone with enticing speeches, but with the message concerning Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the cross of Christ, which of course is the crux of the gospel, is lost and it loses its power. I like what Brother Mark Bailey has to say about this uh, passage or verse here. He says, When people are converted just because of eloquent speeches and emotions, they are not truly converted to Jesus Christ. Such people would obey anything because of the manner of teaching, regardless if truth were presented or not. You know, that reminds me of some of the TV evangelists today with their shiny smiles and catchy phrases and, and warm, fuzzy sermons. We need to be careful that we're not drawn only to men and their emotion-stirring speaking skills, but to the truth which is taught. Well, Paul will have more to say about men's wisdom versus God's wisdom in the rest of this chapter, which, Lord willing, Brother David will cover in our next study. In closing, though, I hope that we've seen tonight the seriousness of the sin of division. Paul certainly was concerned about it, and so was our Savior, in fact, Jesus prayed for unity among his disciples in John the 17th chapter. And of course, he died to make our unity with him and the Father possible. Tonight, are you one with Christ? Have you been buried with him in baptism? If not, then we encourage you to take the steps of obedience by believing, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized into Christ. Or if you've once obeyed, but you've now stand at a guilty distance, then make those wrongs right by repenting of your sins, confessing them, and praying for God's forgiveness. If we can assist